good to see everyone. Thank you for being with us today. It's exciting to be with you, uh, even, if, even if it is on the internet. Uh, we long still for the day when we can assemble together, but uh, we're so grateful and glad that we have the opportunity to gather together uh, in families and homes uh, across wherever you may be. We've had some reports of uh, folks listening from all over, and we're really excited and appreciative of your faithfulness to God's Word in this way. Um, so, and by the way, just so you know, uh, of course, we do the Facebook Live uh, for Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, and we, of course, we're doing other little talks and different things at different times. We try to announce those to you, but also, you can go to uh, Coggins Church YouTube channel and subscribe there, and of course, there's, I believe, over 200 uh, messages and studies, talks, and different things there, but you can also get the latest message uh, at your convenience if you happen to miss it or you want to go back and listen to something or study it more closely. Uh, someone showed me or shared with me this week, and it was a great blessing to my heart, that they liked uh, to go back to the YouTube channel and then listen again so they can stop and take notes and look up scripture passages and so forth. So, uh, of course, that just uh, warmed my heart to know someone would do that and, and they're that committed to the precious Word of God. So uh, those resources are there for you and we're always trying to do those kinds of things. You can also go to our website, listen to messages there, and we have a blog there. So you can go to the blog and read uh, many articles uh, that uh, I or others in our ministry here have written that will hopefully enrich you and strengthen you, and some have found that to be a great blessing as well. Well, this morning we're going back to our series through the book of Philippians, and uh, of course we said that that's radical joy uh, in community. So we are looking at this book we've been going through now for some time, uh, in fact, recently, uh, before the Easter holiday, we were looking at chapter 4 and talking about peace. And, that, of course, that's the theme throughout chapter 4. We first talked about peace in the church. Then we, said we looked into peace in the heart. And then today we're going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, at peace in our hearts. Uh, I think we have two or three more in this series that will uh, almost take peace and turn it like a diamond so that you can see the, the different facets of the peace of Christ, both in the congregation and in our hearts. And we'll have, it, I think, one message on hindrances to peace. What are the things that hinder our peace? So we will, we will have one message on that as well before we conclude the book of Philippians. Well, if you have your Bible, uh, again, we're in Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to go ahead and read there in verse 8. Familiar verses, but oftentimes we, when, when we have passages that are so familiar to us, it's good for us to take a few moments and really dig down and make sure that we understand what those passages are teaching. Verse 8, Finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Now, you know, I've heard as a pastor um, many times, believe it or not, uh, I have had members or other Christians will come to me and say, well, pastor, uh, it's not as easy for us to live for Christ in the world uh, as it is for you or for a minister or a missionary uh, because 
Uh, we are working out in the world, and you are working in the church, and so it's so much easier for you to live for the Lord than it is for us. Now, of course, I would say to that immediately, I work in the world just like everybody else, so that's a, a false dichotomy. But I also understand uh, that there's two things more to that statement. One is there are particular problems and difficulties that challenge those of us that work in full-time ministry. It's not necessarily easy uh, to live for the Lord here. There are particular temptations that come with being in full-time Christian ministry. We'll talk about those some other time. But the second thing I would like to acknowledge is that there is some legitimacy to uh, that complaint. Uh, in the sense that I can come in uh, or a minister can come in and, uh, and have moments and time for prayer or study of the word uh, that maybe will prepare me to be an encouragement to other people. But for those that, uh, that don't work in ministry like that, many times they might have to get up at, you know, very early in the morning. Their entire day is filled with responsibilities and uh, trials and difficulties. They might be surrounded by unbelievers all day long that uh, tempt them or, in, or are antagonistic toward their faith. And so, you know, I would think and believe and always have that those, there is some truth to that person's or those people's statements. Uh, it is true of all believers that to live in this world is difficult to honor Christ and live according to his word and to deal with the anxieties and difficulties of a pagan godless world are real. In fact, they're so real that the Apostle Paul gives this whole section, this context, the anxieties of living for Christ in a pagan society. That's where I want us to understand this peace of mind that we're going to be studying this morning. It is very difficult to go out when everyone around you, perhaps, or most of the people around you, are reacting to life's problems and difficulties and the sins of our culture in one way. And the believer is supposed to react and deal with those in completely the opposite way. Because the truth is we all suffer from a little bit of a herd mentality, don't we? So it's easier for us to go with the crowd or the herd than it is for us to go against that herd or against the tide or the stream or the current of the society around us. And so that produces stress and anxiety, maybe even perhaps fear uh, in the believer as we seek to live on the principles of Christ and his gospel uh, in a world that values neither him nor his word or those who follow him. And so uh, the good thing is, is that God's word has not left us alone. The word of God gives us the answers to these things. In, this, in these two verses, uh, we see the Apostle Paul's teaching to the Philippians on how to deal with this uh, anxiety of living uh, like we are citizens of the kingdom of God while we are alienated in a, in a culture that is dominated by the kingdom of Satan. And these are real struggles and real difficulties, but so are the truths that are in this passage. These are powerful truths that you and I need and we need to make part of our life. So, you know, we, often we're overcome because we have looked at the world and not through, looked at the world and our problems through the world's eyes and not through the lens of God's word. And so Paul is calling us today to see things differently. He is calling us to have the mind of Christ, to see the world and our anxieties and our problems through the lens of the word of God. So I hope that you will uh, maybe take a few notes, maybe do some underlining or whatever you need to do to begin this process of inculcating these teachings of Christ into your life 
because they will bring you peace. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is telling us here. In fact, he tells us in this passage, I've broken it down in two ways. He gives us in this passage things to ponder. Things to ponder. And then the second thing we see is a person to pattern. A person to pattern. So it's a pretty simple outline. And uh, I believe, though, that it, it brings it into focus for us to understand the text and see what the Word of God is teaching us. So first, let's think about things to ponder. Things to ponder. And I would say under that, maybe, or as a subtitle or, uh, or something out to the side, think in terms of the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? You remember that in Galatians? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, you know, uh, of such there is no condemnation. This is the fruit, the work of the Holy Spirit within the life of the believer. Why do I say that? Well, because there are some scholars uh, that have tr tried to argue that Paul the Apostle here is pulling philosophy from pagan uh, philosophers. That moral teaching from Greek philosophers of his day. And so they've even argued that this is this whole whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure and lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, they've argued that this is a quotation, possibly, uh, although they can't produce one, but a quotation from uh, pagan moralists and philosophers during the apostles day well i don't believe that at all and i don't think that's what is happening here the apostle paul is clearly teaching that these are uh, manifestations of the work of the holy spirit these in fact he even says to the uh, believers at philippi follow my example like in other places he talks about these kinds of virtues so I think it's a pretty shallow argument that Paul is borrowing from Greek moralists and philosophers uh, when in fact these concepts, these, these virtues come from the God of peace and they come from the Holy Spirit and they are lived out in the life of Christ and of his, uh, his apostles and, we are, and they are commended to us through uh, the Apostle Paul in his writings here. So there's no reason to believe this has any philosophy from the world, but is in fact from God himself. In fact, I would even argue that to take this from the world, to say that Paul is taking this from the world is, is absolutely contrary to the, the Apostle Paul's point. His point in this passage is to show us how we, in the midst of a pagan society, can have the mind of Christ. And so for him to use pagan philosophy to tell us to live for Christ would make absolutely no sense and would ultimately be contradictory. So I don't believe for one moment that that's what's happening here. Uh, although I respect those scholars that, you know, many of whom were, are conservatives, uh, but I just dis, dis heart, uh, completely disagree with that interpretation. No, these are, uh, these are the fruit of the Spirit manifest in the way we think, the way our minds are, being, uh, are operating, the way and the things that we focus our hearts and minds upon is what we're, we're called in this passage not to be victims of our thoughts, but to be masters of our thoughts. We are called in this passage for Christ to be the master of our thoughts. To bring every thought, as Paul says in another place, into captivity to the law of Christ. For us to walk in the spirit, to say it another way, uh, and not in the flesh. So oftentimes we think about these kinds of things only uh, moralistically. We think of uh, do's and don'ts, you know, our grocery list of don't do these things, but we do need to do these things. Whereas this is, is geared and directed 
to our minds. The Apostle Paul is not saying, uh, you know, don't wear these clothes, don't do these things. The Apostle Paul is saying, give your mind under the submission of the sovereignty of Christ. Bring your mind into submission to the Word of God. So he gives us some things to ponder. And of course he does this in a very memorable way. He does this in an artful way. Uh, I would even venture to say a poetic way of thinking. He knows that there uh, were any, if there's any corners of our hearts and minds left, we will dishonor the Lord. He understands, Romans chapter 3 teaches, the depravity of our hearts and minds. Our minds are many times at odds with Christ. And if we do not bring them in submission to Him, then our minds will create all kinds of corners where we can hide sin and live for, Christ, live for the world or love the world or hide our own personal anxieties, our pet fears, our pet uh, contemplations, our Sinful hearts and our sinful minds will find places and ways to do that. But Paul is saying, wage this war in your heart and your mind. And so there, how do you do that? Well, you do that by uh, thinking on these things. First, he says, whatever things are true. Whatever things are true. What does he mean by that? Well, think of the word truth. Whatever is true truth. In other words, fill your heart and mind, give your time, give your mental energy to truth. Do not spend our time, uh, the apostle is saying, we should not spend our time filling our heads with falsehoods and fables, lies and misunderstandings, wrong ideologies and worldly philosophies, but we should give our hearts and minds to the pursuit of truth. Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, hunt for wisdom, search for wisdom, mine for wisdom, as, as if you were searching for precious jewels, rubies, and so forth. What was he saying? First of all, he's saying that truth is buried in a godless society. Truth is hidden in the, in the society that's uh, dominated by sin and lust and rebellion against God. But those of us who know God and should love truth, those of us who know God through Jesus Christ, those of us who have renounced sin and repented of our old works, are now on the pursuit to mine for the truth of God, to wipe away the debris, to dig deep, to work hard, to find truth and to meditate upon truth, to settle our hearts and minds upon truth and therefore to allow truth to transform our hearts and minds and belief system. We begin to be controlled by what is truthful rather than being controlled by what is false. And can I say to you, if you believe everything that comes across the TV, the radio, the news, or in magazines, or the internet, then you, believe me, you have lost the truth. You need to dig for the truth. And where do you dig for the truth? Well, the first place you need to start is God's Word. The Bible is God's truth. And the Bible will begin to help you understand everything else that you see in light of it. It will help you see what you read in the newspaper or see somewhere. Is that true or is that error? It will give you discernment. It will help you. As oftentimes we ask, we say, you know, pray that I will have discernment or Lord, give me discernment. And that's a good prayer. There's nothing wrong with that. But the truth is, if we only pray for discernment and we do not fill our minds with the Word of God, that'll be an unanswered prayer. Because discernment comes through the truth of God. So I would say that first one, whatever, think on these things. Whatever is truth. Whatever is true. And I would say that's truth over falsehood truth over falsehood secondly he says whatever things are honest honest what does this word honest mean 
Well, it has the idea of whatever's noble, whatever's dignified, whatever has a exalted uh, sense about it. Things that cause us to aspire rather than things that pull us into the mire. Okay? So, and you know what I'm talking about. Our world is filled with it. And if you fill your mind with it, it will drag you down with it. In fact, we live in the days of the reverse um, snob, what, what many scholars and sociologists have called the reverse snobbery. You know, many, many years ago, everybody wanted to be, you know, high class and so forth. Well, now everybody wants to be, quote, low class. There's this reverse snobbery. And so, you know, now you don't want to, you don't want to appear high class. You want to appear low class. And that's just a wind of, of fad in our society. I'm not pushing one or the other. But what I'm saying is that as believers, we need to recognize that these are worldly philosophies. And we should not be swept up into those things. But we should give our hearts and minds to things that call us to a higher level. Things that call us to nobility. Not royalty, nobility. Things like courage and virtue, strength and honesty, integrity, truth. Things that talk about, you know, things that call us to sacrifice for what's right. To give ourselves for the ones we love. This is what calls the father to go to work and to live a godly life. To be dedicated to his wife and the mother of his children. To teach his children and to lead them in the things of God. This is what calls a wife to honor her husband and to follow his leadership, to nurture her children and to lead them to Christ. This is what calls us to study God's word. The things that call us to dignity. In fact, we're in a frivolous society now. We're in a society that's afraid to be serious about anything. But can I say to you that the word of God calls you to be serious about things? Some things are just simply not a joke. Some things are too important, too valuable, too reverent to be made fun of or laughed at. And that's something that our culture today needs to remember. He also says whatever things are just. So we would say truth over falsehood, dignity over frivolity, and then we would say righteous over unrighteous. Whatsoever things are just. Christians should meditate and put our minds upon being just. Not always fair. Fair is subjective. Just is according to God's word. We should study what it means to do what is right. To tell right from wrong. To be people who do the right thing. People who support other people who do the right thing. It scares me in our modern society how sometimes there is this tendency now to support the, the, the wrongdoer, to glamorize the bad guy uh, or the bad person or the bad woman, you know, in movies and TV because, you know, the bad guy wants, you know, is more interesting. I can even remember when I was a child and, and uh, some friends and I, we used to play different games and we'd play cops and robbers and things like that. And uh, unfortunately, and I'm ashamed to say that almost all of us boys wanted to be the robbers. We didn't want to be the cops, you know, and and that in a lot of ways is an example of our sinfulness. We find more interest in the bad guy than we do in the good guy. Why? Because we are not we are not putting our hearts and minds on what is just and what is righteous. We have not portrayed as a society the beauty and the, the desirableness of, of righteousness. Uh, but instead, we have glamorized the, the unrighteous. And so, as believers, you and I need to resist that. We need to recognize it, that it is a product of a rebellious uh, mankind that does not want to follow the justice of God. But as believers, 
We have come into subjection and submission to this righteous God. We've been benefactors of His grace and His holiness. And so we should want to learn and to be righteous people and to support those who are also that way. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are pure, what is this? Well, it's moral purity. You know, blessed are the pure in spirit, Jesus said. So in other words, uh, we should pursue purity in our relationships, purity in our life, moral purity, spiritual purity. Our minds should spend time meditating on the beauty of purity, the, the glory of what is good, what is holy, not immorality. We should resist immorality. We should shun immorality. We should pull away from immorality. The Apostle Paul says, flee from every appearance of evil. Flee, he says to the young man, from every lust. Jesus says, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. So in other words, there should be this, this desire to, to dispel impurity from our lives, to get rid of it, to purge our lives of impurity, to be moral and pure people, not moralists because we're saved by the grace of God, but moral in the sense that we are honoring Christ with our new life, that we are followers of the Holy Spirit. We are led by the Spirit. We bear the fruit of the Spirit. We understand the Word of God. We seek to be obedient to the Word of God. So this is done out of faith and love, not out of raw obedience and moralistic pressure. And then we see whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are lovely. You know what? This word lovely is not used much in the New Testament. And it has this idea of, of whatever's pleasant, whatever is the old word comely. Can I give you a new word for it? Beauty. Whatever is beautiful. Now today we think of beauty only in the sense of outward appearance. We have such a shallow, narrow understanding of what beauty is. But it, as we talked about once when we were going through the Gospel of John, we talked about uh, that beauty is a spiritual concept. And that beauty, with, with beauty comes moral and spiritual purity. There's a reason why Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings makes uh, good appear beautiful and bad to appear, to appear ugly and dark. Why? Because this is reality. God is beautiful because he is holy. And Satan, we can, we can know that he is ugly, not, because, not in looks, but in character. He is dark and ugly. Of course, we know that angels, demons, come to us uh, as spirits of light. Satan and demons can make themselves you know, appear or attempt us in ways that appear beautiful. But true beauty is holy. It's godly. It's good. It's bright. So what is he saying? He's saying, whatsoever things are of moral beauty, whatsoever things are bright, Whatsoever things that would magnify God and would beautify the life of the believer. Meditate on these things. So we have, we have truth over falsehood, di dignity over frivolity. We have righteous over unrighteous. We have moral over immoral. We have beauty over ugly. And we mean that by, not by looks but by character, moral beauty. Uh, and then we see whatsoever things, and this is a, a summary statement, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there's, any, if there's any excellence, if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things. Do you see what the apostle is saying? He is saying that you and I do have control of our thoughts. We are not victims of our thoughts, but we are commanded to bring those thoughts into obedience to Christ. 
We are commanded to call those wrong faults sin and to confront them in our own hearts and minds and seek the aid of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God and prayer and the fellowship of other believers to wage war against every thought that raises itself against the knowledge of Christ. This, beloved, is the battle of all battles in the Christian life. Maybe you fought when you got saved to quit this bad habit or that bad habit, but can I say to you that there is no bad habit that is harder to fight than this one. This is the one that will determine, quite honestly, whether you win any of the other battles. Because the war is waged, it is either won or lost in our hearts and in our minds. Either Christ will reign in our hearts and our minds, or we will give way to the lusts of the flesh, which is what the apostle is saying in Galatians. You say, well, Pastor Scott, nobody's perfect. We all have bad thoughts. You're right, we do, uh, including me. We all have bad thoughts. We all wage this war. And sometimes we win a battle, and sometimes we lose a battle. I love the saying that, Traditionally, Martin Luther, the reformer, the great reformer, once said, uh, he's, al he's always recorded as saying, uh, referring to your thought life, that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop him from building a nest in your hair. Well, I love that because it's the truth. Sometimes things pop into our head. Sometimes we have an evil thought or a lustful thought. But we have to chase that away. We have to confess that as sin. We have to fight it with the word of God and with prayer and with the encouragement of the church of Christ. But we can stop it from making up a home in our head. We don't have to allow it to have any space or any room. So that's things to ponder. Things to ponder. This is what our heart and mind should be constantly pursuing. Are you struggling with depression? Are you just struggling with discouragement? Are you struggling with lust and sinful thoughts or anger, or bitterness, short-temperedness? Wage this war. Fight this battle. And this will change your life. Things to ponder. All right? But then we also have a person to pattern. A person to pattern. Here we see the great importance of discipleship or mentorship. What is the disciple? What is discipleship? Well, it is mentorship. Discipleship is not just attending classes. Discipleship is finding someone to learn from. Someone to submit your life under so that you can learn both the knowledge and the practice of this godly person. So husbands, you want to be a godly husband, find a godly husband and begin to learn. Wives, if you want to be a godly wife, find a godly wife and pattern your life after her. In fact, the New Testament even says that. Let the older women teach the younger women how to love their husbands and to care for their homes. This is true of men as well, not just, just women. We all need this. A young minister needs old ministers and, and experienced ministers. Everyone. We see this apprenticeship idea all over the world, don't we? We know it works. It's an ancient tradition. This is what discipleship is. Discipleship is mentorship. It's apprenticeship. And the Apostle Paul is saying, he's not talking in the abstract. He's not saying, you know, philosophically, think on these things. And that's it. No, the Apostle Paul says, and do what I've shown you. In fact, he says, the things that you've learned and you've received from me, the things that you have heard and seen in me, do. And the word do means practice. Make it a part of your life. You know, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't know how to put it into practice, it's not doing a whole lot of good for you. We don't learn the Word of God, do we, just to win trivia games. We learn the Bible so that we can live for Christ. We can weather the storms so that we can stand before our beloved Lord and hear, well done, you good and faithful servant. 
enter into the joy of your Lord. We all long to hear that. We all long to please our Christ, to love him, to show him our love, to hear his acceptance, to receive his smile. And the only way we do that is to learn how to uh, practice, to uh, learn his word and then uh, apply it and practice it in our lives. And that's done through spiritual leadership. That's done through a mentorship, apprenticeship, discipleship. In fact, you say, well, a person to pattern. Well, who would be the first one? Well, the first one would be Christ, isn't it? Christ himself, back to the Apostle Paul, who's the one saying it right here. He says, the things you've, you've received and learned from me, the things you've heard and seen in me, practice. So that's the Apostle Paul. But in another place, the Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So we see that Christ is our pattern. The apostles are our pattern. Then we could say that that same idea is to be flow into spiritual leadership. Pastors are elders, deacons. These are the spiritual leaders in congregations. This is why there's such hard and high standards in the pastoral epistles for elders and deacons. Because elders, which are pastors, are to be these examples. These are, the believers are able to look to the elders or look to deacons and say, how can I live the Christian life? How does, what does the Christian life look like? And they're able to do that by spiritual leadership, by observing pastors or elders and deacons, which is the same thing it says in Hebrews where he says uh, to obey them that have the rule over you, referring not to worldly leaders or civic leaders, but to spiritual leaders, pastors or elders and deacons. He's saying obey them that have the rule over you. Why? So that they might care for your souls. So these are, uh, they are charged with living this godly lifestyle. The same thing that James said in his epistle. He said, basically, be not many teachers or elders uh, among you. Why? Because later he says that, uh, how do you determine a false teacher from a, a, a true one? Because the true teacher is humble, is filled with grace and kindness and gentleness. Sound familiar? Whereas the false teacher is filled with, with lust and pride and satanic influence. And so we see this concept of Christ, the apostles and pastors or elders and deacons, and of course the general leadership of the church. Anyone who is in spiritual leadership, whether it's an elder or a deacon, if it's a Sunday school teacher or anything else, if you are in spiritual leadership in the church, then you are held to a higher standard. You must step up and follow Christ and be an example for other believers. And that's the simple truth of the New Testament. And so we have this things to ponder and we have a person to pattern. And so what happens if we do that? Well, let me read this passage again and we'll draw all this together, okay? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Now, remember that our whole context is peace, isn't it? And we started this section off with, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard or keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Okay? So we start off with the peace of God. And when we follow these things and live in the way that Christ has called us to do here through the writings of his apostle in the New Testament, we not only get the peace of God, but we get the peace, the God of peace. Did you notice that? The apostle almost takes a, a parenthesis here 
And he starts off with the peace of God. And then he says, when you do these things, the God of peace will be with you. Well, how do we get the peace of God? We get it from the God of peace. So in other words, your peace, my peace of heart and mind, does not come through uh, stoic uh, fortitude. It does not come from the world's philosophies. It does not come from uh, medicating ourselves or, or uh, you know, finding some escapism uh, through drugs or sex or alcohol or, or whatever, which is sort of what I mean by medicating. But it's made, it is found in God himself. God is our peace. He is our peace. I love this because we could, if we're not careful, we could get off in the pursuit of peace and never find it. But if we pursue God, we get peace. And Paul is so clear to help us understand that. This is not a pursuit of peace. It's a pursuit of God. It's a pursuit of His truth. It's a pursuit of His smile, His acceptance, His love, His grace in Christ. And with that comes peace. Well, thank you for joining me today. And I'm praying that it will comfort your heart and encourage you in your walk with Christ. Thank you so much and God bless you.